Hey, Carl here to say that Music to Code By is now an app called Music to Flow By. Now you can listen to the tracks on your phone with offline capability. The first three tracks are free, and the entire catalog is available by subscription with a new track arriving every month. Just go to musictoflowby.com for all the links. Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. And we're in some focus room somewhere in Times Square in a Microsoft building at Microsoft Connect. Yes, 8th and 42nd in yep. downtown Manhattan or midtown Manhattan. It's been a while since I took the subway. That was an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was almost as bad as Tokyo where they push you in, yeah, you know? Yeah. If there was somebody pushing me in, it would have been a little bit easier. But as it turns out, the Express to 8th Avenue is kind of packed this yeah, time of the morning. Yeah, busy. Anyway, Seth Wars is here. Paige Bailey is here. We're going to be talking AI for Visual Studio. But first, we have a very important message. It's called Better Know Framework. Awesome. <laughs> All right, dude, what do you got? Are you tired of fake reviews? <laughs> <laughs> you guys we're can going? laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Seth is like holding back. We're all in the same room. I was trying to make it like the show have some continuity here. I'm thinking of the, the, the fans, the show watchers, <laughs> listeners, I guess. You have watchers, we have listeners. Yeah. And there's a good reason for that. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, so this is a, a website called FakeSpot, oh. FakeSpot.com. And it's sen essentially you paste any Amazon product in and it analyzes the reviews and tells you which ones are fake and which ones are not. Interesting. How does it do that? That's a really good question. <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to that. However, it does have credibility because it has been seen on, and I quote, USA Today, Gizmodo, Daily News, Money Watch, CNET, CNBC, Yahoo, BuzzFeed, Tech Insider, and Lifehacker, which means absolutely nothing. nothing. What happens if you put fake spot? <laughs> <laughs> fake, fake spot. spot. Does the internet crash? <laughs> That's a good question. I, my immediate reaction to that is to feed in the three wolves sweater. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Amazon product, because those are some of the greatest reviews known to man. <laughs> I want to know if they're fake. There are some literary classics oh, yes. hidden yeah. amongst those. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's what I got. I thought it was neat. It tickled my uh, funny bone and go check it out. Fakespot.com. That is Who's awesome. Who's talking to us, Richard? Grabbed a comment off of show 1483, which was the AI panel we did in Europe, in Stockholm, which a certain Seth Juarez was a part of, uh, mm -hmm. along with uh, Tess Fernandez and Jessica Engstrom. I thought it was a really fun conversation. And this comment's from Wayne Tanner, who's hilarious, because he said, I was listening to the show on the morning commute yesterday, when near the end you were talking about your daughter yelling, hey Siri, delete all my apps. <laughs> <laughs> my truck immediately paused playback, switched over to Siri, and said, could you repeat that? <laughs> no. <laughs> Thankfully, the command wasn't recognized. The potential exists for impacts ranging from the annoying prank to breaking and entering with voice-activated automation systems, and the risks are not yet well understood by the majority of people. The good news is you didn't say... Hey, Siri, send my porn collection to my mother. Because <laughs> oh. you could have gone there, too. I know. Would anybody classify their porn collection so Siri would know about it? I don't know. Uh -huh. I think that's, well, you know what? I think we're about to find we're out. We're about to find out. <laughs> <laughs> the moral of the story, listen to .NET Rocks with headphones. <laughs> uh, I just found out that um, I read a news story where a 10-year-old kid broke into her mom's iPhone with the face recognition, right. the iPhone 10. Yeah. The mask situation? And the mask situation mm -hmm. in Vietnam. Some yeah. scientists made a mask and they were able to break it. It's just not a good idea. It really uh, isn't. So, uh, Wayne, of course, you've caused some trouble. Thank you so much for your <laughs> comment. A .NET Rocks mug is on its way to you. And if you'd like a .NET Rocks mug, write a comment on the website at .NET Rocks .com or via any of our social media because we publish every show to Facebook and Google+. Plus. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a mug. And go ahead and follow us on Google. I'm at Carl Franklin. He's at Rich Campbell. Send us a tweet. We paste them into fake spot. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just say follow us on Google? Did I say follow us on Google? <laughs> yes. Follow us on Twitter. You That's know. what That's you do. That's the one. Yeah. Send us, us a Twitter. tweet. Because we oh, pasted it to Facebook. follow us on Face right. Place, where you may see me. <laughs> 
Uh, let's uh, introduce our guests, of course. Seth Juarez holds a master's degree in computer science, where his field of research was artificial intelligence, specifically in the realm of machine learning. Seth is an evangelist for Microsoft and devotes the majority of his time making videos for Channel 9. When he's not working in that area, he devotes his time to an open source machine learning library, specifically for .NET, intended to simplify the use of popular machine learning models, as well as complex statistics and linear algebra. And the name of that Project is New ML. Newell. New ML. Okay. Links in the show notes. And Paige Bailey making her debut on .NET Rocks is a developer advocate specializing in data visualization, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Prior to joining Microsoft, Paige was employed for five years as a data scientist and geophysical application developer in the energy industry, Chevron. Languages of choice include Python, R, and SQL, and she's always down for a jam session on sustainable energy, STEM education reform, and using data science products to empower local governments. Clearly my better. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm aware that Paige and I could completely derail the show. Let's do it. <laughs> Talking about climate change. Absolutely. But, but dude, I am so stoked to talk about Visual Studio, though. I, um, I Me too. I, I mean, I, this is good stuff. So we'll do this show. We'll do another show. All right. <laughs> That's okay. good news. We'll have lunch. <laughs> Perfect. We'll Might talk about be a geek out before we're done. But yeah, we'll do a show. Visual Studio AI Tools, what is that all about, and what's it officially called? Uh, Visual Studio Tools for AI. Okay. And I'll give my – so just to set some context, my role changed a little bit. I'm now also a cloud developer advocate, and Paige is my colleague. Ah. Mm -hmm. She actually has real data science experience. Actual data scientist. Yeah, actual data scientist. I just play with algorithms mm -hmm. Okay, is how it should be thought about. And so one of the things I like about Visual Studio Tools for AI is when I did research in school – we use Python. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the mo most as one does. Yeah, as, <laughs> as one, one does. does. Yeah. Right. And I had to use like Edit Plus, you know, as my editor. And I had to do a lot of print statements. And I had to run this thing for 80 hours, you know. I'd have to go to lunch. And then, because I remember there was one problem I was working on. It had 15,000 columns and like 4 million rows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Pandas wasn't around no, then. It no. wasn't popular. Yeah. And before Edit Plus added the plus, yes. it could <laughs> handle that data. No. It would do it, but I would have to leave it for six hours. Yeah. And so, Visual Studio Tools for AI, which is cool because, uh, you know, Visual Studio already has support for Python. They added this ability to actually have, like, real nice file new uh, experiences when you're starting with deep learning frameworks, such right. as TensorFlow, uh, CNTK, uh, other ones. And they have some really nice, like, install this example. But then you can run them on VMs. You can run them on like, the Elastic Cloud using mm. uh, Batch AI, or you can run them using Azure Machine Learning, which allows you to save how these things work over different times. Because once you run the thing, it's over. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And not to distract from the story here, but I had grabbed the link to Edit Plus to add to the show notes. <laughs> It's, it's garbage. It's just such a vintage website. Like, <laughs> yeah. In some ways, it make, gives me a warm fuzzy because it's not bootstrap. It hasn't been minified. It's just Seth like, is uh, like their only paying customer. I, like, <laughs> like after four years of, of like of college, right? I like yeah. I'm gonna pay them. Right? I think I was using their trial experience. I don't know what it was, yeah. or I think my trial expired. I'm like, I think I'll pay them. Buy now, thirty five bucks <laughs> for a forever license. I, I I bought a license like fifty years ago. I don't know when it was, and then I emailed them. I'm like, hey, I I lost my license. They're like, oh, here it is. I'm like, okay, you make me buy it again. I would have bought it again. <laughs> so so the tools for AI, just to be clear here, are for people who want to do their own machine learning algorithms and work on their own data sets. And you probably should know something about that whole milieu to begin with other than somebody who just uses a cognitive service for example absolutely so cognitive services are wonderful in that they're just simplistic calls to a rest api mm. so you don't really need to have any insight into you know building out a spark cluster or, or how you would go about architecting a deep learning system like all you have to do is just call your rest api right, but right. these ai tools they are so rad that they have convinced me to try visual studio for the first time ever Whoa. Yeah. Uh, heard first here. Yeah. Now you've For just only serious. recently joined Microsoft. Right? Absolutely. August I of 2017. Started at the very beginning of August. Wow. And, so and you were not really in the Microsoft stack before then? Not particularly. Hmm. Python and R is kind of its own special, sure. you know, special snowflake kind of world. All the development usually happens in R Studio or Jupyter Notebooks or those sorts of things. Right. But I've gotten really excited about some of the stuff that Microsoft's recently done for Python. 
mm. um, especially in terms of VS Code and um, things like the Azure Machine Learning Workbench incorporating Jupyter Notebooks and Azure Notebooks, which are an Azure instance of Jupyter Notebooks. So I think what's cool is that instead of saying we need to make our own thing, right? Yeah. We know that there's a lot of good things out there, yeah. and we need yeah. to support them in a better way. Now, Microsoft has a relationship with R. I don't want to say they own R because it's more complicated than it's, that, right? It's Revolution Analytics. We ended up purchasing a separate company and getting all of their wonderful R expertise in the, the Microsoft house. Ah, uh, I see. So, more of the aqua hire mindset of, like, mm -hmm. we need these minds, so let's bring Revolution Analytics as part of the company. Pretty and that's much. what some of the stuff in SQL Server, like, for example, you can run R directly right. on SQL Server, like like yeah. you would in a stored proc kind of with thing. With machine learning. With machine learning. So, yeah, That's Python cool. and R machine learning on top of SQL Server 2017. That was announced at Ignite, I think. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so it's pretty clear that AI is becoming important. And what we're doing, I think, at Microsoft is we're saying, all right, let's gather all the things and let's see if we can help, you know, push forward. Right. Because because there's so many things, there's got to be a way to unify these things. And I love how Microsoft is really jumping ahead and doing that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now... SQL Server has a role in all this, or is it the SQL Server team, right? I'm not sure. Like that's because they, they have the machine learning server, which seems to fall under the the SQL Server group, which mm -hmm. I find interesting. Mm -hmm. The thing about these algorithms is that you have to be very efficient with with memory, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to know your way around data. And what better team to do it than the SQL Server team? Well, sure. You, and you are working with a ton of data. I mean, yeah. that's just yeah. by this nature. And Absolutely. I, I almost think that the big data terminology is is passe now all yeah. data is pretty darn big well yeah. i mean i don't know like I'll, I'll be honest most people have medium to small data you yeah. know people come to me and like hey i want to do some big data i'm like oh how big is your database oh five gigabytes i'm like okay. <laughs> so it will safely fit in ram that's yeah. what you're saying yeah. yeah and so that that yeah. doesn't count big data big data for me is when like you have to have this data on multiple machines right Absolutely. for it even to fit at rest yeah sure Multiple terabytes. Yeah. yeah. So, I, you can now buy, build a terabyte SQL server. Mm -hmm. Oh. If you don't care about money. <laughs> <laughs> As some don't. 384 DIM slots in this machine. Holy wow. cow. Wow. Oh, this is a beast. But yeah, you, know, you can put a terabyte into a SQL server. I now. did not know that. I that didn't know it it's, either. It's still a one comma number, but only barely. Wow. <laughs> so one thing Visual Studio is really good at is templates, right? You, I, wanna, I don't want to just start with a blank project. Sure. You, are mm -hmm. there templates for? Yeah. So if you, if you do a file new and you do a Visual Studio tools for AI, I think that's the node that it's called. It actually has like a starter for cafe, a starter for TensorFlow, a starter for CNTK. Mm -hmm. And then one of the things that for those that are listening that are wondering what, what the heck is he talking about, deep learning has made a, maybe we should talk about deep learning and why this is kind of cool. Deep learning mm -hmm. is kind of a cool way of doing machine learning because before we kind of had to massage what we put into the learning algorithms, yeah. but right. deep learning sort of made that a little bit better. Absolutely. So with deep learning, um, the hype cycle is, is that you get feature engineering for free. So instead of having to have somebody with domain expertise or somebody to be, you know, the special snowflake who decides like, oh, maybe we should incorporate this one aspect of a data set into multiple aspects or consolidate multiple aspects into one, you're just basically throwing your data at deep learning and deep learning figures out what's happening with the data and gives you an answer. So you're talking about deep learning as a product name, not as a technology, right? No, we're talking about as, as a technology. technology. Oh, okay. yeah. and so we had to start with that because I said, here's all these file new and I'm talking about all these things. Like, these you frameworks. Know, frameworks. These are deep learning frameworks because you can implement your own which, I mean, you, it's fun and it's a good theory exercise for you to do that. But there's already been frameworks that have been implemented that are very powerful. I get you. Yeah. Right? And so the, the reason, just like Paige said, is you can throw, a, if you throw a lot of data at it, it seems to be very good at figuring out what you want. And so when I say file new projects, I'm saying file new that has a TensorFlow deep learning framework. Yeah. yeah. That has a cafe deep learning. And so you can get started with whatever you want to get started. In addition to that, because those will give you the blank files, it will have all the nice import statements in right. Python and you just type the thing up. And usually these these things are very, like the code is almost always less than 150 lines yeah. of code, mm. to be it's, honest. It's very small. Yeah. Wow. It takes a long time to run. Yeah. There is this great anecdote from Jeff Dean at Google who said that they rewrote their entire speech translation application, so translate.google.com or whatever it's called, from 500,000 lines of like statistically focused modeling with one-to-one -one matches to like 
five hundred lines of TensorFlow. Wow. So five hundred thousand to five hundred. Can we talk wow. about what the heck you mean when you say TensorFlow? Absolutely. Why don't you take that? Awesome. So so TensorFlow is an example of a deep learning framework um, that Google has implemented. Microsoft's alternative would be CNTK, um, and it is a static computational graph that allows you to do uh, sort of these these very complex uh, big data in reality big data focused uh, deep learning projects. So um, all of the cool, what was it called? Deep Dream or, yeah. or the Dream, yeah. the whatever it was. Uh, where the, you, the Google Dream thing that was absolutely, super creepy. Yeah. Super duper creepy. And, yeah. and like being able to feed in a photo and have it print out in the style of Van Gogh. Right. Um, all of that is is based on this this deep learning architecture. So, so you did that. So give me the... Yeah. So give me a really good, and I, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around that, but an example of a data set that would fit this uh, they tensor They kind of all would. Yeah. Really? Especially image files, Yeah, though. image files are the best. Yeah. Can we talk about that, the demo you did? Sure, absolutely. Where, where you had these... MNIST. The MNIST data no, with the hand drive? No, he's talking about the image transfer one. Seth and, and Scott Hansman took a picture together and then applied, like, the style of different abstract masters to it. Yeah. And, like uh, Van Gogh, like yeah, you yeah. said. Yeah. And in, in, instantly, it was super fast. Yeah, absolutely. But, it, but and impressive. Like, you were actually like, I think I want that as a bio picture. Like, they were good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I think the joke was we're selling prints afterwards. No one really took me up on it. Yeah. <laughs> I printed like 5,000 of these things. and like. Uh, so, as an example of TensorFlow's, you know, this deep learning thing, can you talk about that project? I presume that was deep learning. It did. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about it. I don't, I don't, I didn't run the models, but it, think of it like this. Think of... Okay, so you know about neural networks. So deep learning is the hype way of saying neural networks that are very stacked. Mm -hmm. Got it. And sometimes they loop around on each other. Yeah. And That's sometimes they have this way of doing, like, for example, time series data. Yeah. So think of, like, this computer science graph that feeds forward, and then some math happens. It's almost like, imagine getting, and I have the weirdest way of thinking about things, so hopefully people can picture this. Think of the starting gate, you know, the horse gates at the, like... At a racetrack? At the mm -hmm. racetrack. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. imagine having a lot of those gates, like, all in a row, right? And imagine that each horse is a bit in the picture, Right, yeah. and, and what happens is, as you optimize these things, there's like little dudes sitting in front at, at the top of each of these gates that's learning, don't let that one through, or let that one through, but like make it smaller. Or, and so what's happening is when you're optimizing these algorithms, you're passing data through, and at the end, they're saying, hey, we've made some mistakes, and everyone, like sort of every guy, like tells the guy before, you need to fix it this way. And right. that's called back propagation back and it, propagate. yeah awesome. and and just think of it as kind of like bull mm, uh, detection right like <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 it's basically going through and and as each one of these little nodes in a layer as each one of them learns you can tell which ones are telling you the truth or not that's right and you can preferentially pay less attention to the guys that are just like oh you know it's totally totally you know and no so problem. in some cases the gates are shut in some cases they're open just a little bit so yeah. it sneaks in through so so think of those guys that are standing on top of those doors as the multipliers to the data that's coming in. Right. Yeah. And then at the end, there's a smoothing function that's placed over all of them. And so you you push the picture forward. Let's just say the Scott Hanselman picture. You push it forward, right? It does something to start. And at the end, we look at this Van Gogh picture and everyone at the front says, no, you know what? You should fix this one. And then the guy say to the ones before, no, you should fix it this way. No, you should fix it this way. And that's the optimization or the training process. And it goes back and forth, back and forth. And the reason why it takes such a long time is because, one, you're giving it a ton of pictures. Right. And, two, you're having to find this optimum, right? right. And that's yeah. where the calculus and, part comes in. And when you say long time, how long are you talking? It depends. Uh, like, correct answer for just about everything. Yeah. But, it, but hours? It could be months. months. Like, so, like, if, if... It's about the, how much compute you throw at it? Yeah. So, like, think huh. of, think about Bing caliber data, right? That, sure. that looks at basically every web page on the internets. <laughs> that, would, that would be a model that would take weeks or months. Absolutely. But yeah. the example that I gave uh, for digit recognition, you notice that I kind of, like, I let it run, and you saw it took about probably a you two minutes. You only had to sing and dance and wave your hands for a little while to yeah. actually compute that model. But it did it. It did yeah. do it. And I think a big piece of this now is 
that we have such massive amounts of compute available, right? Yeah. Your, your NVIDIA Saturns and all of this high-end mm-hmm. GPU stuff that seems to be perfectly designed for deep neural net. And yet, if they're not perfectly designed, we're building out chips to perfectly yeah, design well, yeah, it. Yeah, the FPGAs now. They're, yeah. they're, now that people want this stuff, they're unoptimized for it. Like, there's a new arms yeah. race, and it isn't in the traditional x86 CPU now. It's the GPU guys running yeah, right. this high-end hardware. The right. tensor processing units. Folks, give us one second here to pay the bills. Hey, Rockheads, this is Carl. Have you tried JetBrains Rider? It's a new cross-platform .NET IDE that's light yet powerful and comes from the makers of ReSharper, IntelliJ, IDEA, and WebStorm. You can write .NET code on Windows, Mac, or Linux. Rider has you covered. Rider helps you develop ASP.NET, .NET Core, .NET Framework, Xamarin, and Unity applications. Most languages used in .NET development are supported. From C Sharp, VBNet, F Sharp, and XAML to ASP.NET Razor syntax, JavaScript, TypeScript, and all that other front end stuff. It comes with navigation, thousands of code inspections, refactorings, unit testing, debugging, rich coding assistance, and more advanced IDE features powered by proven technology from ReSharper and WebStorm. Download Rider now and take it for a 30 day trial at rider.com. Dot net rocks dot com. That's R I D E R dot D O T N E T R O C K S dot com. And you're listening to dot net rocks. We're here in New York at Connect talking to Paige Bailey and Seth Juarez about the AI tools Visual Studio, which I'm not sure we've talked about at all yet. <laughs> well, the thing is that we, we, the reason why, and I, I think maybe Paige would agree, is we have to explain, You're right. first of all, why these things are hard. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then once you know, because like, look, we can say, oh, look what this does. And I was like, I don't care because I don't know what problem it's solving. Yeah. And so notice in the first half, we've set up that we have to train these things, which tend to use a lot of resources mm-hmm. and tend to use a lot of of memory tends to use a lot of uh, CPUs. And they're also very, very difficult to debug because think about it. What can you do to debug it? You can change your data, maybe. You can try to uh, use a different algorithm or try to tweak Clean it. your data. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's the answer, I, isn't I, it? I do go back to my 90s knowledge of neural networks when it was only the three-layer thing mm-hmm. and we talked about overfitting, like right. overtraining. Oh, all the time. Mm-hmm. All the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, so there's still a problem. Oh, absolutely. Um, there was a conference just recently called train ai and the ceo of kaggle got up and talked about you know the millions of machine learning projects that they have listed in kaggle and some obnoxious percentage like 98 percent are are overfit how do you figure that out that something is overfit because uh whenever you test them on the the test data set they have they're extremely performant on the training data set and not on the test what does it mean anyway to be overfit great question so uh when you're building a model, you have a you have this collection of data, right? And let's just say you use all of that data to create a statistical model to predict that data, and then you use that same data to see how good the model is. So the example, again, going back to your demos, the apples. So the, you had a picture of, I think, 200 apples. Yeah. 200 different pictures of apples. Mm-hmm. That was your training data. Kind of, right? Because remember, I told Anna, 200 apples is not enough, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Right. Again, because you're the old school machine learning mm-hmm. guy. Yeah. Well, no, no. Is the new school better? No. What's happening is that they're using something called transfer learning, hmm. which is a little bit even more complex. So imagine, remember how I told you there's this horse track with a lot of gates? Yes. Yeah. Imagine right. taking half of that horse track, taking all those dudes that already learned something and putting them on a different problem. Interesting. So that's called transfer learning. You've, oh. you've used part of a neural network to, to train another neural network. And the that's point being, fascinating. you had a train set for pineapples and oranges. They have a train set for a lot of stuff because they're using Bing data. Okay. And they're using those models that are very strong initially, and they're transferring that over to learn about the apples. Another object. Mm-hmm. Now you just start thinking about, well, what are you transferring? Really? What right. is the advantage of this already trained piece? That it understands that a, the contrast recognition between an object and a background? So the advantage of having a model that's already trained is that you're able to very quickly make a diagnosis of what happens to be in a new picture. So cognitive okay. services, for example, trained on the corpus of Bing images. Out of the box, it can recognize Apple, Pineapple, Kevin Bacon. It can yeah, recognize nice. Kevin Bacon. 
bacon. Can I recognize real bacon? That's my question. Absolutely. It, it can and it does. And also the deliciousness quotient. That's, awesome. yeah. that's something we've been doing a lot of research. The DQ. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Say, oh, this is a high DQ. Wait, wait, in fact, if anyone wants to submit any, you know, examples of delicious <laughs> bacon yeah. for us to do more research, we're oh, certainly yes. amenable to that. I think half the messages, oh, that. half the images I put on Twitter were bacon. Also. <laughs> yeah. 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 So this notion of transfer learning is you're taking a neural library. And so the question is, what is it that you're moving over? They're literally numerical coefficients on these dudes that are saying, how much should I open the gate? And it turns out that the, at the lower levels of the network, yeah. it's learning something about images in general. Interesting. Yeah. So does it, does it start with, if you transfer, say, pineapples to apples, does it start with the things that work and finally in, filter out the things that don't work? I don't or? know. Like, my, like, we really don't know what's going on in the middle of these things. Uh, mathematically, we know what's going on, but intuitively, you've seen those weird pictures, you know, on Google where the they have, like... The grayscale ones? Yeah, yeah, the scary ones where it's like there's a cat mixed with a person, right? Because yeah, yeah. it's trying to learn the difference between a cat and a person. The thing about it is in the middle, it's literally learning numerical coefficients my personal opinion or sense is that it's learning like about edges it's learning right. about like colors it's yeah. it's like separating the image into its essence right when and you then you showed you have, this mm -hmm. when you showed that zero wow. as numbers yes mm -hmm. and, it, and it was it was almost ascii art because yeah. the background was zero so you saw zero 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 and then it, the number went up a little bit the highest number was sort of the central part of a of a line and then it went back down again and in fact it asked it out to show you sort of the shape of a zero. Mm -hmm. yeah. And wow. that, that was what the computer was actually seeing at the beginning of the neural network. Sure. And then when it goes into there, it's multiplying numbers by those things. So notice that because there's so many of these gates and there's a lot of zeros in there, it turns out that the gates are not very active in some parts, but they become very active in others, right. depending on the data that's coming in. And as you go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, all the little men at the gates get a lot better at knowing which bits to let back and forth. Right. And then that's where the neural arc happens. And then when you take, uh, at, notice at the beginning of the layers, it's doing some fundamental things and then it's doing more specific things at the top of the yeah. layer. Right. And so when you take the middle part out, those fundamental things that are happening, you can use and transfer. And that's yeah. transfer yeah. learning. I get it. Okay. Does that make, is, am I getting this yes. right? So my, I'm backing all the way up to your original question, which was the overfitting effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you've trained this model on a particular set of data. Mm hmm and now if you test it against that data, it'll get it 100% right. Right. But if you get new yeah. data, it gets it 50% right. Sometimes. That is overfitting. That is absolutely overfitting. Okay. Yep. I gotcha. So it seems to me that having a community where people can share their data sets, their coefficients, their all of these things really enables a different, a whole different level of AI. I mean, I think if I was faced with having to start from scratch with my data, clean it, train it. You know, do I, it would take me a long time to get results, but if I could just go to a community, plug in some stuff, maybe buy a data set. And that's why the people who have access to the most data are going to be the kings and queens of deep learning and, and why these things like cognitive services are so important. Kaggle for that matter. I mean, yeah. Kaggle seemed, we did a show on it ages ago. We did. That, that really was this idea of here's a community of machine learners with different tools and different approaches using a common problem. Yeah. yeah. And then comparing and discussing. Although yeah. I have found, and you know, you worked commercially in this. Mm -hmm. How much of what you did, did Chevron ultimately consider company secret? Because I've often run into the case where we were all happy to talk and stuff until it worked. And then they didn't want to talk anymore. So, obviously, a lot of stuff is under NDAs, sure. right? But in terms of general methodology, right? Like, the problems that we were that we were focused on were how to drill faster, right. more efficiently, um, how to recoup more from a completions, mm -hmm. which is... So, drilling, you know, that's very straightforward. It's like, how fast can you get through the rock? Completions is more like, how well can you hold that rock open? as the oil comes out over right. decades. Yeah. So maximizing those things, it sort of impacts your bottom line directly. And, sure. and the way that you would go about that is by using a whole bunch of data about rocks, about the performance of, of tooling that you have, pressures and temperatures. Mm. We'd get thousands of values from downhole every one to two seconds, right? right? So you pull it in with Spark Streaming, you kind of architect your solution with that, and then, you know, run a random forest or whatever machine learning model. Just dropped a few things there that I'm still scratching my head with Spark <laughs> Streaming. Look, there's three of us that do AI and ML in the cloud developer adversary group. It's me, right. it's it's uh, Vadim and Paige. Right. Vadim is like the high performance computing used to work at IBM guy. 
Right. I am the algorithms guy, and she's the one that actually did stuff. The data science, <laughs> right. the and actual so, practical. And so we, we're like, hey, Paige, is this what you do? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, do no I know that's what you learned in school. A little bit. <laughs> 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 but but and so it's really nice to have all three. And then I'm like, is, could, would this work on a big computer? But then we're like, no, this is what you would do. And so we really balance each other out, I think. That's really, really cool. Well. Yeah. yeah, no, I like that a lot. Well, we'll come back to that in a minute. But first, hey, Richard. Yeah, buddy. You guess what time it is now? It must be that happy time again. Right. It's time to back propagate all my mid-show jokes that have bombed and fix them so they're funny. <laughs> all right. It says here I need to increase the use of the word fart by 280%. <laughs> That's a good model there. I like that model. I agree. <laughs> all right. It's actually time fart. To <laughs> give away a de experience subscription from Dev Express to one lucky member fart of the Dotnet Rocks fan club. <laughs> Sorry, I'll stop. I, now. I'm afraid it's working. That's what's making me sad. <laughs> that works. That's a good model. All right, become a UI superhero with Dev Express UI controls and libraries and deliver elegant .NET solutions that address customer needs today and leverage your existing knowledge to build next generation touch enabled solutions for tomorrow. Whether it's an office-inspired application or a data-centric analytics dashboard, DevExpress Universal ships with everything you'll need to build your best, without limits or compromise. And check out their DevExtreme React grid on GitHub. It's built from the ground up to fully support all the cool features that come with React, like virtual DOM and state controllers like Redux and all that. It supports master detail sorting, grouping, paging, and editing. So, as I say, check it out on GitHub. It's free. And learn more and download your free 30-day trial of DevExpress Universal at devexpress.com slash superhero. All right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner is Dustin Martin. Congratulations, Dustin. Woo! Yeah. I'll clap. I'll clap for you, sir. I'll clap for Dustin. <laughs> Dustin just won the D Experience subscription, a big pile of awesome from our friends at DevExpress just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. What is that you say? Well, if you go to .NET Rocks.com and click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, you can join the fan club. And we have thousands of members all over the world. And every show, we like to give away stuff from our sponsors. And every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree. Is it this show? Nope. Nope, not this show. Pretty close. It's it a, is. It is a December show. It so. is a December show. Ooh. It's real soon now. But you really want to get your name in there. And we also, of course, like to ask our guests, if you had $5,000 to spend on technology today, Paige, what would you buy? Oh, my gosh. So $5,000 to spend on technology. Mm -hmm. I would, well, so if you had asked me like four months ago, I probably would have said compute. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. But now we can just rent it. Yeah. <laughs> now you work for the company with all the compute. Pretty much. Yeah. That is, what is that? That's like cloud privilege. Yeah. That we yeah. <laughs> cloud privilege. Yeah. <laughs> But um, now, I, gu I guess, uh, things that I would want, I, I would want to probably update my desktop and then also You're get... You're about to move, so... This is, this is quite Nothing. true. <laughs> he, he is not impressed. She's like, <laughs> I just want a better computer. <laughs> Doesn't everybody... Actually, know? most people, that's what they get when they win. Yeah. Every time we've actually yeah. given away the thing, in yeah. the end, it ends up being a computer of some yeah. kind. Ver varieties on it. But you yeah. know, you are... If you're moving to Redmond, mm -hmm. you're going to have to up your gadget game. Right? Well... You can buy one of those unicycles that drives up walls. <laughs> oh. No, I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> it's like, huh? <laughs> so the the strange thing is, is like I, I've used Microsoft at work for you know since forever, and at school, you know, my, it was all Microsoft. But my laptops at home, so all four of them are still running Ubuntu. Right. Um, yeah, and and it's well, that just makes you hip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. That's the first time I've ever heard Linux being referred to as hip. Oh, well, it is today. It is today. Is. Only yeah. if you have ironic facial hair, uh, <laughs> which I do. <laughs> Everyone, picture it now. <laughs> <laughs> Like a little hipster mustache yeah, that sticks I, this, out. Uh, and I've curled it with wax. <laughs> <laughs> pretend I did. I, I didn't, but just pretend. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah. We're getting into some Latino yeah, cliches now, here. We're now we'll get hate mail from all the hipsters. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Seth, what would you buy with five grand? That's a good question. I probably buy like a really nice TV and an Xbox One S. Mm -hmm. X. Wait, Xbox the One X. X One. What? It's the X is the new one. Yeah, the new one. What's it called? I don't know it's what it's X. called. Okay. Xbox One First X. First there, there was a one, then there was a one S, now there's a one X. 
So, mm. so oh. Microsoft calls them X. Apple calls it ten. Is that how it goes? It? Yeah. 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 Well, it's window. It's all. It's all about tens now. Windows right. ten. You know, iPhone ten. It's all yeah. about tens. It's all about the mm-hmm. tens. It's all about yeah. tens. I did look up a couple of electric unicycles because there are a bunch of self balancing <laughs> electric unicycles. Oh my gosh. Of course you did, <laughs> Richard. Of you did. You know, I, I was wondering who might do that, that and is, yeah. we have here the man who did. You buy a thousand dollars for a good one. You know, and they're small. They're small and light enough that you can carry them around. So it's the sort of thing you would ride. You know, from your home to the bus or to the subway, and then mm. you can get on the subway with it. Mm-hmm. And if you have mustache wax, you can get on the subway free yep. if you're riding a unicycle. <laughs> it's true. And I, I feel like with a unicycle, my comedy game would be much better. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. at least for all of us. Yeah, right. Going, I, you know, I would be <laughs> injured. A wall into the sea. And it's like, <laughs> there would be a lot of injuries. Slapsticks. <laughs> <laughs> but I would definitely make YouTube. That's, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I can see you in the top hat with the mustache and everything. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. I, I think little. I need to start that. On an electric unicycle. And a monocle, of course. I gotta have a monocle. Oh. Yeah. Goes well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just singular round things. That's what you do. <laughs> singular round things. Have we actually talked about Visual Studio no, for AI? Not yet. Uh, Visual Studio tools for AI. I think we started to because templates we have because it is about yeah. the the CTNK and CNTK, Tensor, CNTK. Uh, CNTK yeah. and TensorFlow. So being able to take bring that data into studio and be able to work on it from from a studio yeah but the question you asked was about spark right i don't know about spark so Paige is going to educate all of us right now i've heard of it i think i know it has to do with streaming data stuff and joining but yep so that's a that's a component it's an apache spark project so it's open source Yay! yay and what it is is a way to um to sort of implement uh clusters for these these intense compute tasks and the the way that i mostly deal with it it has been in terms of sparkly R, which is like a sparkly R. Sparkly R, yeah. yeah. It's a Spark interface for R, the programming language, and then also PySpark, which is a Python interface for Spark. And what those two packages allow you to do is you can just write code in Python or R for machine learning similar to the way that you would do it on your local machine, Mm -hmm. and it automatically parallelizes it and does its Spark magic to make it work on these large distributed systems. So that's nifty. Yeah, so the, right. Like I'm, and now I'm, I'm actually suddenly thinking this was a Hadoop problem back in the day. Yeah, we you know we pull in strangely we were pulling in literally terabytes of instrumentation data, mm-hmm. and there was a non-trivial chunk of time of mapping of breaking mm-hmm. that data across all the machines yeah. we had. Yeah. So this is something that does that in real time, like as it's yep. coming in, you're pushing across the machines, so you can do your reduce cycle. Yeah. So what we did with Spark streaming at my previous job was all of the sensor data that we had coming from downhole in the oil wells, we um, pulled it in with Spark Streaming and then placed it into tables in Hadoop um, so that we could do real-time analysis uh, of the of the and data. There was and there some, the, the word forest was used in there somewhere, which oh, is... Random it, forest. It says random forest is a machine learning algorithm yes. uh, that creates machine learning models. Right. Yeah, it's like a decision tree, but with more on trees. steroids more yeah. trees <laughs> more trees it's a whole yeah. forest i, I feel like we should trees. call it forest <laughs> yeah because it has more trees yeah and it and it works so the nice thing too we, we talked a little bit about deep learning and a bit about machine learning and deep learning is a subset of machine learning right because mm-hmm. it's just these stacked neural nets but the thing about particular algorithms in machine learning is that some are more easy to track why a decision was made rather than others mm-hmm. ah. so if you have an oil company who's making you know million of dollars or billions of dollars worth of investments and they say well hey Paige Bailey why are you telling us to purchase this thing as opposed to this other thing right it's um, that much more expensive like is the ROI you, can yeah. you, have, the you, you have, have an algorithm to blame when it goes wrong absolutely yeah. you can say it made this decision because you know we believe this much oil to be under the ground because these kinds of rocks and also right. this whereas deep models. learning you you don't really There's know a bunch of guys with a bunch of numbers <laughs> yeah. Yeah. on top of gates and you don't know yeah. why they have those numbers yep. I mean, that's actually been a, a fairly important talking point when we talk about the governance around a lot yeah. of this technology yeah. is that that some of these deep learning models are very opaque. Yeah. And, it, and when they, in a critical system, make a decision that is unexpected and potentially has negative consequences, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's like, well, what do you point to? Absolutely. You know, was the model wrong? Was the training wrong? Like, we you know. It's almost always the data is wrong. Yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. there are so many instances, too, with ethical algorithms, like ethical sure. implications. If you have data sets that, you know, somehow point to a racial or, you know, gender based thing even though yeah. not necessarily that's incorporated i'll give you a real example hit me it turns out that for some reason african americans are disproportionately arrested 
True. Yeah. At least in the United States. Yeah, let's yeah. just say in the United States. Let's just say a particular city. So what happens when you build a machine learning algorithm that's going to predict where you should go in order to arrest people? And you use that data. Sure. Yeah. And then what happens when you feed that data back in? It gets self reinforcing. Yeah. Yeah. So that is an ethical problem. Right. Like Absolutely. There's, a, there's biased data. And what it's going to do is it's going to create biased models. Yeah. Right? And, and also there's an, there's an related issue where there's a test that prisoners are given to determine when they should be released for parole. Recidivism. Yeah. Yeah. And a number of those questions are things of do you know anybody who's been arrested? And if you're African American. Yeah. It's almost because hard. they've they've been disproportionately arrested, even if yeah. they haven't, even if they didn't do anything wrong, right? You're gonna have that problem. Yeah, and another wow. question is: uh, Are your parents divorced? Like, right. and so so things so you now can't we play a control. Socioeconomic game that yeah. uh, that biases the data. Again. Yeah, yep. and so that's a challenge. So now we've we've gone through this entire meadow of wonderfulness to land now at why do we need tools? For AI and Visual Studio, sure. Right. So the, the the let's let's walk back a couple of things. The first is she talked about Spark, and she talked about how this is happening on a bunch of machines, and you have this ton of data. If I run play on my local box with Visual Studio and try to do stuff like that, what's going to happen? <laughs> right, there's not there's not enough stuff. So one of the benefits of using Visual Studio tools for AI is it's directly connected to these things called deep learning VMs or data science VMs where I'm running that job on this VM with 24 virtual CPUs, with 224 wow. yeah. gigabytes of RAM, with four Tesla GPUs running that can access that data from the cloud because it's in the cloud and then run those jobs. And I'm sitting there looking at it like I'm flying this ginormous plane and I can actually see these GPUs light up. Yeah. Right? Wow. And, yeah. But the thing is like, wait a minute, Seth, if I want to, I have to start that VM and then I have to stop it because sometimes you have to you have to have a very special VM that you set your own stuff up. But what if I just don't care and I want elastic compute? Then you run that job on something called Batch AI, which is also a feature yeah. in Visual Studio Tools for AI, right. which elastically scales out the compute uh, that you would need yeah. just to run that. And also just recently announced, we have a collaboration with Databricks, which uh, is, you know, it, it's very aligned with the Apache Spark ecosystem. And they are one of the best implementations of Spark streaming commercially that, that you could have. Absolutely. And so just, and this is a partnership. This is not an acquisition. This is a partnership. Right, okay. yeah. And so think about like this algorithm that I'm running on my local box that then I push up to this compute context. This has access to these Databricks Spark streams. Yeah. That's all of a sudden running this huge stuff in this elastically scalable way if you're using batch AI. Mm -hmm. And then once you run the thing, you get this output. But then what if you want to know how much better this model is getting over time? Then you can run it using something called Azure Machine Learning Context, which will then keep track of your models it will keep track of how good they are it will show you how they were trained and that's the third node inside there of visual studio tools for ai and so you have in visual studio tools for ai you have the ability to run in remote context such as a vm a remote context such as elastic and scalable gpu cpus memory you have access to these things like databricks in the cloud and then finally if you want to be able to collaborate and you want to be able to manage these models then you can run these things in azure machine learning experimentation and model management service directly there from Visual Studio in such a way that you can keep track of your models, you can collaborate with other people. And so we went through this whole, you know, wandering through the meadow of machine learning to show you that it's a hard thing. But with Visual Studio tools for AI, you can actually run it as if you're cloud native right. Right. Mm -hmm. on a tiny machine. Yep. Right. And that's the power of well, it. Well, your machine mm -hmm. is just a console to yeah. what's yeah. running up in the cloud for you. So, does that, hopefully, we wandered around enough no, so you it. could see that why it's yeah. actually powerful there in the end. And yeah, I why it. I am convinced that I should move to Visual Studio because wow. this is something that I wanted so hard out of every other data science environment I've worked aren't, in. Aren't there, uh, yeah, I was going to say, aren't there other data science environments that do this? It's no. So, there are some that attempt to that are commercially available that you have to pay a, a lot of money for. But the typical data science tools are things like Spider for Python or, or Jupyter Notebooks, which mm -hmm. have none of this. And then also our studio, which is more focused on kind of the data engineering, data cleaning aspects. And the oh. cool thing is that this extension is free. And you know that there's a Visual Studio version that's also free. Right. Free is my favorite yeah. price. <laughs> so, the, so the Dev Essentials, I think, is, yeah. The, yeah. The, is the free edition of Studio. And it can run... Yeah. The tools for AI. Yeah. And yeah. if it doesn't, I'll go talk to someone and be like, hey, this is dumb. Yeah. Because to think about it, the idea is that we want things to be cloud native. And, sure. and, and in the end, right, we are all about our cloud. And so anything we can do to get you to run these 
incredibly important jobs in the cloud we want to do. And also, you don't even have to use Azure if you don't want to, yeah. right? Like you can use any other cloud framework or if you have a, a cluster set up on, on your own premises. Yeah. Like you well, what does Azure cost? Did you, did you call it Batch AI? I think mm -hmm. you did. What well, is it? it depends on the VMs. If you're if you're renting a VM, then you have the VM costs. So Azure Functions, you can run code and you only pay for the compute time that your code is actually sure, running, yeah. which means that you drastically reduce the price tag of whatever hardware you're, but you're all releasing. That compute is is costing money. I mean, is, isn't yeah. it? That's right. Yeah. It is. But think of this. You could figure it out on your own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you could run compute for a couple of hours. Yeah. You What's could, the range of price? I mean, just give me a typical. I, I, I don't, it's like I'm. you're asking me like, hey, you know. If, I don't know. That, so I have an example of the Azure functions, but also like the, the highest end machine that we have for deep learning. You can run it for four hours for the price of a Starbucks latte. Right? Nice. So, so it's like that's a pretty fun afternoon, I mean, right? It's an expensive latte. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it is. But we are talking six bucks. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I, mean, I was just looking on the pricing model here, and it says Azure Batch AI has no additional charges besides the the underlying compute resource you're using. Yeah. So it's Jeez. the name of the yeah. VM you're running. Yeah, that's incredibly. And, cool. and they do support low priority machines. So now we get into this whole other game of oh. I don't actually have to have this model done right now. Yeah. And yeah. Microsoft gives me special pricing if I will take a lower priority. So right. the high priority stuff runs first. It's like, well, we'll run this over the weekend. Yeah, yeah right. And and so the nice thing, too, about the deep learning VMs is that they come sort of prepackaged with every tool that you would want to use. Right. So instead of having to, like, provision a VM and then download all the stuff and take forever. And see if you actually get it configured correctly. Yeah. It starts in, like, a minute. Yeah. And I was getting frustrated, you know, as I start and stop them a lot. I'm like, oh. It's going to take another minute out of my life. And then I realized that what you were doing yeah. before I would use edit plus yeah. and run on my machine and leave for a couple of hours and then come back to find out I had a parse error yeah. you know, on line 25 <laughs> on record 500,000. I'm like, Rrr! or like driver issues with deep learning, right? Sure. Because so much is related to the graphics cards like yeah, that. These are all run on GPUs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. So how much of your mission, Seth, and, and you too, Paige, is educating non-statistician-minded, non-data science-minded developers to actually use these things in a meaningful way? Well, it depends, right? Because like our focuses are different. Notice that I am the more Devi guy. She's the more data science-y person. And so my focus is to help people understand that these models, just like any other artifact that you produce when you're a developer, are immediately consumable and you shouldn't be afraid of them. Paige is more suited to like understanding like, hey, how do you actually go about and build these models, right? Yeah. Because AI, right now we're in this weird like DevOps for AI space, right, right? Mm -hmm. right? Where we're trying to merge these things together. And one of the, the talks I gave at Connect that you may or may not have seen is effectively the beginning of like, hey, devs, this is also an engineering problem, not a yeah. hype problem. And so I focus a lot of time on that. And I focus on, like, I have goofy ways of explaining these things <laughs> that people hopefully in their minds are like, oh, I, I have a sense for what this is doing. So I'm comfortable enough to use a model that was generated by it, but maybe not necessarily comfortable enough to generate one of these models. But if yeah. you've taken statistics in college, you're probably a good candidate uh, to to figure this stuff out. I no, mean, I, I think anyone can understand this stuff. Uh, if I can understand it, there is some math involved. Uh, but once you get a little bit of that math, linear algebra, maybe some calculus, definitely some calculus, you will be okay. And calculus is really just a study of motion. It's yeah. not anything like super... Mm -hmm. Study of analog changes over time. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so that's the thing. I mean, in my opinion, I think anyone can understand these things, but you do have to pay the price. There is sure. some you price to some pay. Time. Yeah. yeah. What do you see as an ideal starting point? Like we've recommended Kaggle before. Mm -hmm. It's just a place when you when you don't have a set, and you're not sure what to do. You know those kinds of things. So there, we did just launch yesterday AIschool.microsoft.com. What? Yeah, that's so, awesome. So you can, and there's also a data science and an AI developer certification offered through Microsoft now. Wow. Um, so that's wonderful. Of course, I love. Cloudera's certification programs. I sure. think that they have excellent resources available. And then there's also, you know, Data Camp. They have amazing tools for machine learning, for AI, for, for data cleaning and mm. Python and R. But, and and yeah. last but not least, we are definitely 
really want people to understand this stuff too. And yeah. so we make mm -hmm. videos. We, I think we're starting a show called the AI show where yep. we're going to be putting this stuff out Great. on yeah. channel nine as well to explain. And we will, we all have different focuses, but we all want to come to this place where you remember before where you were the server guy and then you were the programmer gal that's there's no such thing anymore yeah. right there is this there's been this merging of dev and ops right uh, my sense is that we're moving towards a place where there's going to be this thing called data engineering mm -hmm. which where, is awesome which is not, you, like, you like that term yes yeah. well it's it's the most important thing because the data is the crux of every model that right. you build the algorithm doesn't take long to run or, or very long to tweak but and so you have this data engineering and then you have the data science process but then you have this DevOps process that takes models into the engineering space and that's like that bridge is the one that we're going to be working on the hardest. Yeah. Is it easier to teach data scientists to code or programmers to be data science-y? Data scientists are terrible coders. They are. <laughs> not Paige. Well, no, no, no. I, I, I think that I'm a, I did not have like try accept statements for so long. I didn't have tests for so long. Like it's, it's, the thing about data scientists is when I did research, we just wanted to prove that it worked. Yeah. And so the code... That explains every sample app I've ever seen from a scientist. That's yeah. right. Yeah. It's because it, we're not... When I was doing research, I wasn't interested in making the code look good. Right. I mm -hmm. was making... I was very interested in proving the theories that yeah. were... And so that's sure. why when you see a paper, they'll never show you the code. Yeah, I yeah. Get it. The DevOps process for, for deep learning and machine learning is so interesting too because you have to think of a cadence for the model refresh rate because over time, your model's going to deteriorate. It's going to get less accurate. Mm. So you have to feed it more data and that might be every night that might be every month that might be every you know quarter does all data go in raw or does it have to be cleaned by a human first no not with deep learning with deep learning there's some it's a little smarter about doing its own feature selection because remember there's dudes at the gates that's right yeah yeah, yeah. and so that's that's why deep learning is so nice nowadays yeah. because i we don't have to do because we used to have to spend all this time in this process called yeah. feature selection last yeah. year we were talking you i think it was you who said yeah. you know data scientists spend most of their time cleaning data yeah. cleaning data now, and selecting features yeah yeah but now now as long as it's homogeneous and you right. put it in deep learning it's it's pretty good yeah so what if it's heterogeneous what if it's all thrown in a data lake then you have to do some work to shape it in yeah. a way that it's the same. And and so we also need to be sure to differentiate between data that's already been classified and the stuff that, you know, you, you don't have classification models yeah. for. Because okay. so there's, um, so if you know, like if you have a corpus of images, so things that are dogs and they're labeled dogs and things that are cats and they're labeled cats, then mm. that makes it a great deal easier mm. um, to do supervised or unsupervised learning. But if you don't have images that are already tagged, then you need to think of strategies to do semi supervised learning and that's hard that's a, that's a whole or is there stuff. a pre-processing that goes just to classify yeah. before it goes into your real data so set? to answer your original question we are very interested in getting people to understand these things yeah. it's just like once you understand like this overall process then it becomes a little bit easier to know like, okay, then there's tools and there's frameworks and then there's my data and then I need to put them together somehow. And then once you start to ask those kind of questions, well, where do yeah. I put it? And that's when the learning really yeah. starts to happen. Awesome. Yeah. Well, guys, thanks. This is all, it's always enlightening to talk to you, Seth, and it's great to meet you, Paige. And great to meet you all too. Congratulations on everything you're doing. I, I look forward to more. Excellent. All right. And we'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a